Corinthians 12. And um, I don't think this is going to be too heavy. But I think it's going to be, it's going to be why we need each other. And I guess that's self-explanatory, but I think it's good sometimes just to, to realize what you have in the local church, how you treasure a local church. It's really, really similar to treasuring your marriage. Um, first 12, uh, first 12, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks or slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. So just to pause for a minute, is the Holy Spirit our common bond? He's the reason we love each other, okay? Is he the one who unites us? Yes. And we honor him through our unity. Verse 14. For the body is not one member but many. And if the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members of one body. So what this is saying is our differences make us strong. If I can hear but I can't see, but you can see and we get together, we can hear and see. Yep. Are you okay? Yeah. Our differences are what make us strong, and they are also sometimes what irritate us. No. I'm just saying, it takes a mature Christian to say, stay in the same church for 10 years. Yeah. And be, a, amen? Yeah. And not be a grouchy member, but a happy member. Hallelujah. Hey, did you ever wish you'd marry someone just like you? No. I remember. <laughs> that would not be good. I remember one time, we were right in a place, right after we started the church, and we didn't have any furniture. We were still living in Virginia Beach, coming here to do services. And my husband was sprawled out on the floor in this huge pillow. Now, Pastor Gordon was six foot four, shoulders like this, huge man, sometimes skinny and sometimes not. But <laughs> we went up and down. But he's a big teddy bear guy. And he's spread out. My friend Dr. Kara was down. And she says, you look pretty chill. And I said, he thinks all of life should be like that. Me, the type A. And he, she said, honey, if you had married somebody like you, you would have driven each other nuts. And yeah. I thought, oh, never thought about that. So, okay. Everybody else is so, say my jelly. You all look so much jelly. My point is this. We need each other's differences to keep from driving each other nuts. Hallelujah. Now, this is going to be real. I've been listening to a lot of these leadership podcasts trying to choose the right ones for the class. Craig Rochelle, who does the Leadership Podcast, says this. One thing that all studies agree on is that people consistently rate themselves and their abilities superior to what they actually are. And let me give this example. If you ask a room full of people how many consider yourselves above average drivers, typically over 80% of the hands go up. How do you know, how many of you know that you obviously can't have 80% of the population driving better than average? Okay. Oh, it's getting quiet in here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, where are we leading to? Well, we all know we might have a few little glitches that are hard to get along with, but hardly any of us see ourselves. Okay. <laughs> so we can readily agree that a body that has only the skills that we individually bring to the table is sadly lacking in function. I started to make a list of all the things y'all can do that I can't do. I got so depressed I tore it up. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. We would be here without a microphone tonight. I would be screaming and going, I, I don't know how to do microphones, sound systems, audio visual. May, need we go on bulletins, all right? I find, but I did hear one thing. Come on, it's going to sound like a Craig show podcast. Oh, I heard this is so good. I listened to one. Here, if you want to listen to a funny one, how to get real without getting weird. That's a very good one. <laughs> it is funny. <laughs> See, that's telling too much. It's a very good one. But this one, and I lost my train of thought, hallelujah. Okay, this one, I remember, is how to spot greatness, how to spot excellence. And this is what he said that was so unusual, and I loved it. He said, most leaders think you're looking for well-rounded people. 
Well-rounded people are not where you're going to find superior greatness, just incredible textile technical excellence or whatever you're looking for. He says the people that have this unique greatness, a lot of times they totally neglect all the other areas and you think they're dysfunctional, but if you latch into their greatness, they'll make your organization great. Yeah. Are you following? Yeah, well, I, I, know, I don't know how anything to do but to preach. I do a few other things. I, have, I know a few other things. But basically, Brownies. they... Brownies. <laughs> <laughs> better, I've got two. I've got two. Years ago, y'all, the advisory board's still here, they used to do pastor appreciation banquets, and it was so sweet. But it just absolutely graded on truth. And there's a truth. I'm a lover of truth, even though you don't have my of people. It isn't right to say this person is the reason we have a church. This is what my, our church would look like if I was here in Colonial Beach alone. <laughs> Nothing. There would have been a drama. How many of you can imagine doing that drama the other night by yourself? Play all the parts, write all the script. Do, come on! What I point tonight is that we are greater. The sum of our parts is greater than the whole. The sum of our parts is what's going to reach the lost. Hallelujah. So we can readily agree that a body that has only skills that we individually bring to it would be sadly lacking. If I'm an ear great, but I can't see or taste or smell or walk around and pick things up. Say this with me. We are fully functional only when we work together. And we are fully functional only when we can get along. Now, I, don't, I am not teaching this tonight because I think we're fighting. I don't think we're fighting at all. I believe God is calling us to a season of growth. I believe that, I just see, I'm, I'm more excited about the church tonight than I've been three, four years. I'm excited. And when that happens, we're going to be tested because every single thing around here is going to get stretched, okay? And so for this reason, just hear what you're hearing tonight, and then maybe it'll pop back up when you need it, okay? Your divinely appointed role in the plan of God is defined in connection to the body of Christ. I'm going to say that again. Your divinely appointed role in the plan of God is defined in His sight in connection to the body of Christ. The Lord designed his believers, his sons and daughters, on earth to function as a body. Now, if you came in tonight, and Nathan's hand was underneath the window, and his leg was over under the screen by the drums, and his eye is on the seat where he usually sits, and his um, ear is up here on the stage, that would be dysfunctional. Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, okay, sometimes you make it obvious, you will get it. And yet, I have gone, I think on any given Sunday morning, there are a certain amount of Christians in these two counties, King Jordan and Westmoreland that are in church. I'm convinced there's twice as many that aren't. Because I've gone door to door and I've talked to people. And I run into a lot more born again believers than I would expect. Because these churches aren't very full around here. Okay. But what you have are eyes and ears and stuff sitting all over the place, totally just doing it, doing nothing. Now, why is that? Um, well, we know we need the body. Most people know they need a church. They know they need different members. They're glad to find them. But then you get into a church. I mean, even at the leadership class last night, we figured out we weren't all perfect. <laughs> I mean, that's a revelation. And sometimes they were asking questions you don't want to answer because you don't want anybody to know how imperfect you are, okay? I need to start memorizing scripture. Hallelujah. Once they find out, that the other people are not perfect, it's easier to stay home than work through their differences. Mm. Just as it's easier to file for divorce than to work things out. Yeah. I don't know how many of you have ever been to a place you don't have to nod your head or say anything, but at one point, I really thought being filing for divorce would be easier than trying to make the marriage work. Wow. And that's a sobering thing because it takes work to make the marriage work. Oh, I'm so, this church wouldn't be here if I hadn't decided to stay. Amen. Are you understanding? Yeah. It matters to your destiny. If you look at a list of any of the great Christians who have impacted their generation for Christ, 100% of all of them, that's all, were constantly, integrally linked to the body of Christ. Whether it's D.L. Moody or C. Charles Finney or Billy Graham, they all had many, many Christian friends and co-workers that they respected. It, it, you cannot do a work for God any other way. Whether it's John the Beloved in the first century writing to his beloved 
fellow Christians, or Martin Luther in the 16th century had many, many co-workers and men like Melanchthon that were scholars in a degree that he wasn't. They needed each other. The Lord made our human bodies to function optimally only when they're joined together, not like Nathan Zion's. Okay. He made his body of believers to function together as in, and I would use the example of the drama the other night, I just kept thinking, I'm so glad that everybody that was needed to put that drama on has obeyed God. Because all it would have taken was for a couple of them to get mad at somebody and walk off for that not to happen. Do you understand how important our unity is? Consider this. If we only have great value in furthering the Father's kingdom when we're attached to his body, everybody see that? You'll do a little bit out there on your own, but not much. Then the, if the only place where we're functional and effective against the powers of darkness is when we're a vital working part of his body, if you were the devil, and I'm not saying you are, but if you were the devil, what would you want to do to that body? You want to pick them off. You want to take one little lamb and get them off that wolf. Always look for a little lamb that's getting off to the side. If you were the devil, your number one objective would be to splinter the body in, into quarreling factions and ultimately just splinter them off into lonely individuals trying to hold on into heaven, or to heaven. Now, I was going to put this one thing in here on the belongs here. But when you're serving in a church, some days... And most days around here, we just get the warm fuzzies when we get together. Don't we love each other? It's just so good to get together. We just got the warm fuzzies. But you see, even if the warm fuzzies aren't there someday, because uh -huh. somebody did look at you wrong or whatever, we're still called, selected, and appointed by God to fulfill a certain task. Yeah. He, we aren't just attending church here because this feels right. It does feel right because the Holy Spirit witnesses to our heart. But we're called here specifically as a body of believers to fulfill certain tasks. Yeah. And let me give you an example. One person who is still a member today came 15 years ago for the first time, and they were over in the old building, and she said, I really don't like all these children running around. And I said, well then, ma'am, with all due respect, it's probably not your church, because we're called to children. So a few churches, and I was trying to be nice to her, but she wanted me to run the children off. And I, <laughs> here's my point. We are specifically called to certain things that we will never, ever get away with. We're called to Mexico, to that Bible college. We are called to do everything you're doing at Extreme. And I don't know if you guys know, but you're called to start ministering to youth ministers. I don't know how we can help you, but at some point, God's calling you. You say, are you prophesying? Yeah. yeah. People can prophesy. You're, you're called to start pouring into other youth ministers. And I don't want it to be a big heavy thing that takes too much time, like accelerate. But you know how lonely it is out there right now with so few conferences, and that's something we can do. We're called to that. We're called to love these two bus kids as much as we love our own little ones and to give them the word of God. And when the devil says nobody cares for them to remember, I know somebody cares. Jesus cares. Okay. So my point is this. We, it isn't just like, okay, I, I, this example comes to mind. We had a kind of difficult meeting in 2018 on the mission trip because Pastor Mary, God bless her, is down in Guatemala. They had driven up eight hours or more to, to come and help us. And they cooked for us, which was so sweet, and they have done it twice. And she finally sat us down and said, we love what you're doing here. But she said, we just, it's too much to bring all the pots and pans and all that. I, I said, I completely understand. We appreciate your support, too. And for two years, they let us choose the location of the mission trip we take every August. And she said, so we're not going to be able to come next year. And I thought she even figured, well, we'll go with Guatemala. And I said, the problem is, coming back to Chavez isn't an option, it's a mandate. We couldn't not come back to this Bible college and keep it. I mean, I, have, I can't imagine going before God and saying, well, it, didn't, it wasn't really convenient to go back to the Bible college, so we just like, put up. That's not an option, it's a mandate. So you understand? And we are called to fulfill. And the thing is, sometimes in the past, the enemy has just really attacked my mind. Oh, you don't have the wherewithal. There's not the vision. There's not the enthusiasm. I don't get any of that anymore. I'm so excited. Yeah. We have everything we need, including a whole lot of leadership in this church, quality people, to do everything we're called to do. So I just want to throw that in there. Did you ever think we're talking about sticking together, on a day when there might not be warm fuzzies, 
Most of the time there are, right? Maybe we like, I love talking to you, my friends. So you can have a feel about it. But we go, we see each other, we're jumping up and down. But even on a day you don't feel jumping up and down, that doesn't really matter. When you're married, you're married. Yeah. Now I'm not saying you can't leave a church, but you better know for sure it's God, because when God has really called you, it's a divine thing. Okay? Yeah. If you look at the example of what Jesus Christ set for us the night he was betrayed, what image did he want to leave? indelibly etched on those disciples' minds. Do you know what they had? I think that when they closed their night, the eyes at night, besides seeing him on the cross, they saw his eyes looking up into theirs while he was washing their feet. Let's look at John 13. Now, something about our flesh doesn't crow about this passage, go, woo! But this is the way he left. This, he said, this is how you do each other. He came to Simon Peter, and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand later or hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Well, now, I want you to think about who this is. Why would the God of the universe kneel down to wash stinky feet? I mean, we know this story from so far back it doesn't boggle our minds too bad. But this is the God of the universe kneeling down before somebody who's walked right in the middle of the sheep manure and everything else. Everybody was using those streets. These are deep, dirty, dirty, stinky feet. Yeah. He did it because he knew that we needed his mind-boggling example of humility and forgiveness to stick together. He said at the end, so wash one another's feet. Think about this. Who is this Peter? This is the same Peter who brashly wanted to walk on water and then had to get rescued. It's the same Peter who said, let's build three booths for Moses, Elijah, and you. And the father says, shh, this is my beloved son. Would you please hush and listen? Right? Peter got corrected a lot. In Matthew 16, Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And you know, the Lord said, wow, the father in heaven revealed that to you. And then he said, no, I'm going to go to the cross. And he said, never, Lord. He said, get behind me, Satan. <sighs> this is the same Peter who in less than 12 hours would deny three times ever having laid eyes on Jesus. And Jesus knew that, because he said before the cup froze twice, you know, you're going to deny me three times. And Jesus washed his feet. You see, most of the time when we get mad at somebody in the church, and I'm not saying we are, I don't think it's a problem right now, I still think this is good information in case anything were ever to come up. Most of the time, it's just that we feel like they're a little bit less than worthy of our forgiveness and mercy and grace like we talked Sunday. The trouble with brothers and sisters, I'll be honest here, we can have so many good points and still have some we're working on. That's what I took away from last time. We all have so much going for us and boy do we have a lot to work on. Oh boy. Now, uh, except you all, but just the ones who came last night. <laughs> How many of you are glad that the Lord Jesus Christ did not look at Peter and say, uh, I'll wash the other ten, Judas is gone, just go ahead and go too? He could have. I know a lot of people in the church, if you mess up that many times, you know, have a lot of times to mess up. I'm glad he didn't send Peter out with Judas that night. We would have missed the marvelous epistles of First and Second Peter that teach us about joy inexpressible and full of glory, <laughs> that we are a chosen race and a royal priesthood. Those things in Peter that aren't in any of the rest of the Bible. Yeah. He, we would have missed the Peter who courageously led the church, early church for decades and who preached that fiery sermon on the day of Pentecost. We would have missed the Peter who taught us the godly way to endure suffering and to cast all our cares on him. How many of you are glad, all the way to your toes, that the Lord didn't kick Peter out of the body? I'm, I'm so glad. We are so easy, I mean it's just so easy to write a marriage off or to write a brother or sister off it's just work to work through it and I'm here to tell you, you will be glad Amen. for it, okay now let's finish this passage John 13, 12 to 15 Peter said to him okay, so when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. What does it mean to wash somebody's feet? It means to help them get rid of the dirt. 
you know, sometimes you see a stinky attitude on somebody, don't judge them. Try to help them get rid of the dirt. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Why do we wash feet to get rid of dirty things that need to change and attitudes that need to change? Would you say that Jesus has put up with you? Yeah. Has he ever dealt with some dirty attitudes? I, by dirty, I don't mean immoral. I just mean stinky, right. yeah. smart aleck to the most high. Lone Ranger Christianity does exist, but not among those who want to live full, rich, productive Christian lives, who want to make their life count for Christ. You, don't, you can't be a lone Christian because you have to have a commitment to the cause. I was thinking, you know, I don't know why these things come back to you from years ago. Papa Dallas that you hear us talk about, Reverend Dallas Clements, you should read his testimony book in the bookstore, it's amazing. He was in the Korean War taken prisoner by the Chinese communists and God got it out. But anyhow, the second year, I can remember as clearly as anything, 1985, he was here ministering in the old building and an older couple came forward. And as he looked into this lady's eyes, because she was a little infirm, a little, he said, Wow, let me, I wrote it down. It just came to me today. Maybe I can't find it, but I can basically. He said, you've held it all together. He said, when everybody in that church wanted to fight and talk about you, you ignored them and just loved them and held the church together. You kept the whole thing from falling apart and her husband. It's not like this. And you know what Papa Dallas said? He said, God's going to heal you, and God wants you to know the precious in his side. That church is there because you loved him together. And I know I hadn't thought of that prophecy in years. I don't remember every word he ever gave any. Everybody, my goodness, gave people a lot of words. He's a prophet. But I'll never forget that word because here I am, a young pastor's wife, pretty irritated with most of the church. <laughs> I hit it pretty well some of the time. And here's this dear saint of God just glowing. And he's saying, you held the whole church together, didn't you? And that husband's that, that's who I want to be, and I'm not always, I don't always win, I don't always make it, but I want to be one of those people that hold them together. Oh, now, just real quick, and you probably know this verse, but it's so important, this, this commitment to unity, that the Apostle Paul writes that we should mark out anybody that causes this division, and I don't have anybody here to mark out, so I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but we need to know the scripture, Romans 16, 17. Paul says to the Roman church, Now I urge you, brethren, to keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances, contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. I've often told you that you wouldn't let strife in your home any more than you let heroin or oxycodone or strychnine. But when I hear a gossip in a church, it's just the same as an open jar of, of arsenic in, in the nursery. Or, or a rattlesnake in the hallway. I wouldn't go any more spastic about a rattlesnake in the hallway or arsenic in the nursery than I would about strife in, in, in division of the church. And you say, aren't you being melodramatic? Well, you know, the, the devil is extremely limited in the ways he, he can take a church out. Right. And basically divide and conquer is his only strategy. When we're together, he can do nothing. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now, where you're going, how many of you go to Acts 9? We're going to be in Acts for quite a while. We'll be done at 7.38. That's about 10 minutes. You remember how we've twice in the last few weeks read about how Barnabas took Saul under his wing and convinced the Christians that they shouldn't reject him because of his past behavior? Well, we're going to start there. That's the first time that Barnabas and Paul are mentioned together, and we're going to follow their relationship. Because I would like to tell you that only baby Christians can have a disagreement. And only baby Christians can fight. But these are two hugely successful, honestly great men of God that had such a disagreement they parted ways. And I'd like to tell you that that only happened in the first century. But I know people that in the 20th century, great men of God who hadn't spoken to each other for 20 years because of a falling out. And I'm not, I'm not casting blame. This is war. And the enemy is out to make things look like somebody's out to get you. He's out to make. But we need to be aware of this. So we give each other the benefit of the doubt. We're going to reread. I know you remember this scripture, but after this, it's all new for a while. Acts 9, 26 to 28. When he, Saul, came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples. But they were afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. 
and he was with them moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. So we see Barnabas rescued Saul from the Christians' skepticism. Now, in Acts 11, if you've got your Bible, just follow. It's just straight through Acts. There's a great revival in Antioch. My definition of a friend is somebody who will not let you miss a great revival. If you ever know a great revival, don't tell me. Ooh, my. <laughs> How many of you have ever been to a great revival? We're going to see one where you can say, yes, I've been to a great revival. Amen. You wait and see. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who had believed turned to the Lord. This was at Antioch. And the news about them reached the ears of the church of Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Can I just pause a second? I don't go spastic over every single word that every single prophet says. There's a few people on earth that if they say something, I never just talk it off. Because Papa Dallas was one. I just never saw him wrong. He was so accurate. How many of you said he was so accurate in prophecy? Oh, yeah. Al Fury is another. Uh, he doesn't go around giving words out a dime a dozen. He prophesied over this church that if we will stay on track, we will be an Antioch church. And if you study an Antioch church, it was the hub of revival. Jerusalem and Antioch were the only two places, and I mean, it's, it will be an exciting place to be. That's what I believe. Okay? Yeah. All right. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. They sent part of this off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart. Who is this? This is part of us, right? to remain true to the Lord. Good man. For he was a good man. Everybody say he was a good man. He was a good man. Say, what do you make? Because they're going to later get in a disagreement. Say, good people can have disagreements. Oh. He was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and faith and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. Now this is a real friend. He couldn't bear it. He had to go a long way by foot to get there. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, for an entire year, they, Barnabas and Saul, met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Was Barnabas a good man? Yeah. How long did Barnabas and Saul teach many in Antioch? One year. One year. Don't you know those were awesome times? Yeah. I thought today, I've often longed to relive part of the Jesus movement. I would like to relive that. Here is the great Apostle Paul who sat at the feet of Gamaliel, revealing it in the light of the New Testament. Verse 27. Now, this one of them, named Agabus, stood up. Okay, they're going to do a, a good deed here. Watch this. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there was going to be a famine. Okay, we can limp backwards. We got a new system. You're doing great, Paul, uh, Phil. <laughs> One of them named Adam stood up and began to indicate by the spirit that there would certainly be a great famine over all the world, and this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the, the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to consent a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. This they did, sending it in the charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. So were these men a great team, and were they trusted men of God? These are great men of God, and they were trusted men of God. Acts 12, 25 to 13, 1. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they fulfilled their mission, taught, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. So now they're back in Antioch with Barnabas' cousin Mark. Now there were in Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, going to go fast, Lucius, Minian, and who was brought up who carried the Tetrarch and Saul. So they're having a prayer meeting. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I call them. Pause. Did the Holy Spirit of God himself call Barnabas and Saul to work together? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, next verse. Then when they had fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went out down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. So John was with them in Antioch, and now he's on the missionary journey. Let's see where we want to go from there. Um, verse 13. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos, came to Perga and Pamphylia, but John left them. And returned to Jerusalem. 
Now, that doesn't seem like a real significant statement. We don't know if he was homesick, if it was too tough, he didn't like the food. We don't know why, but he went home, okay? Now, skip down to Acts 15. This is when things get serious. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we are proclaiming the word of God, or where we proclaim the word of God and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along, who had deserted them in Pamphylia and not gone with them to the work. I guess he didn't like pantyways, you know? And there occurred such a sharp disagreement. Now, this is not two baby Christians. These are not two run-of-the-mill. These are two of the greatest men of God on earth at that time. And what are you saying? It's not a disgrace if you have a disagreement. It happens. But I do believe there's glory in reconciliation. Yeah. There occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now it never mentions Barnabas again for the rest of the word of God. But I'm happy to tell you that Paul forgave Mark. Mark did not drop out over this. And this is important. Do you know that? God doesn't like it when somebody falls through the cracks. Just look at two scriptures with me. Colossians 4, 10, 11, we find out that Paul or Barnabas and Mark were related. Paul is writing here, and he says, Aristarchus, my fellow, fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas' cousin Mark, among whom you received instruction that he comes to you, welcome him. So not only have they reconciled, Paul's in prison and Mark's there with him, ministering to him. And, and Paul's writing him a letter of recommendation. Say, by the way, if he comes, you receive him. Everybody say, three cheers for God. Three cheers for God. Anytime there is a rift between you and another relative and you can't even speak, only the devil gets glory. I can't be super close to all my relatives, but I want us to be friends, to be on good terms. Amen. That was why I'm here. Okay, and also... Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be an encouragement to you. So he's saying Mark has been an encouragement to you. One of the scripture where Mark is mentioned, 2 Timothy 4, 10 to 11. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Christians has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he's useful to me for service. So here is Paul specifically asking for Mark. Yeah. And he's like, what's the big deal? I like it because I just don't think a rift has to be forever. I think, I think you know, Benny Hinn had a, a divorced his wife and they got remarried and happy as can be. I'm so happy about that. When I saw that, I was so happy. They saw the marriage. I was so happy. It just wasn't God's will for them to be. Oh, I don't care. I'm so happy. <laughs> well, you know why? Because Jesus is happy. Amen. I am convinced that the reason we get miracles easy here, and we do, we get miracles easy, is because we treat each other right, or we at least do our best. We're not perfect, but we're aiming at it, okay? Yeah. What have we learned? The enemy desperately wants to put a magnifying glass on our brother and sister's faults, and he desperately wants to divide and conquer. We have to see him as the enemy and not our brothers and sisters. There is a glory in reconciliation. The last scripture I want to give you is on unity. And it's in Psalm 133, verse 1 to 3. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. Now, there are three characteristics of or a fruit of unity in the psalm. In the first verse, could we read the first verse and then come back to the list? Well, behold how good and how pleasant it is. If a church is in unity, it's pleasant to walk in the front door and your kids do not want to leave. Yeah. Okay, it's pleasant here. Amen? If it's pleasant at your house, all your teenagers' friends will come over to your house because there's peace there. Yeah. Okay? When there's unity, it's pleasant. Verse 2, you'll see another characteristic. It says it's like the precious oil. Oil is always, always the anointing. Unity causes the oil to flow, the anointing to flow, because God's happy. 
God is happy in this place. Sometimes I'm worshiping and the Lord just says, I like this place. This is my happy place. I'll come in here on Thursday afternoon and God's here. I said, what are you doing here? We're not here. You know? He says, I like this place. Yeah. I've had evangelists come in and say, we walked in to use the bathroom. Remember Carla said, I walked in to use the bathroom and felt God. That's good. <laughs> Third characteristic. Like the dew of Hermon. It's like that life giving water that causes fruit. Let's go to the list if you would. But what will you only do to your home? You'll make your home pleasant. The anointing of God flows. And a dew that breaks life. You can't put your finger on what's happening right in life. But there's a life here. Yeah. You know, I go with other pastors and they want to interview me. You know, just kind of figure out our secret. And I want to say, well, our secret is we love each other. We really try. Not to hurt each other, but that would take that as an insult, because I'm sure they think they are too. But the true, if you ask me, the secret of new life is that we're in unity. And the characteristics of that unity is pleasant, the anointing flows, and there's a dew that brings life. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. You want, Bill, you want to, I don't remember whose turn it is. Terry, I, does anybody remember? Somebody's going to take, I'm supposed to have the courage to stop doing certain things. I learned that in leadership. Hmm? I remember you did it last week. Does anybody remember the week before? I think it's Terry's turn. Was it, was it you the week before? Come on, Terry. I think it's Terry's turn. I'm serious. <laughs> I love teaching. I don't like all the details. God bless you all. <laughs>